Will anybody be able to read it in 20 years? Will anybody be able to read it in 200 years? Will anybody be able to read it in 2,000 years? Oh, it's really easy to lose information, even, even over the course of you know, uh, a few generations. As I was thinking through a massive wiki and how to, how to make it, one of the things that was in the back of my mind was, um, heaven forbid someday we have uh, some kind of uh, societal collapse where we, we don't have access to the same level of technology uh, that we do today. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Above the Chaos. I'm excited to be here today with one of the smartest people I've ever met and one of my best <laughs> thought partners, a phenomenal technologist, Pete Kaminsky. Pete, welcome, brother. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Nice to be here. Um, why, don't, why don't we start off with just uh, just a, a brief little story of who Pete is so uh, the audience understands who they're listening to as the quest unfolds. Uh, I call myself a... Um... Uh, entrepreneur and technologist. Uh, got a background in uh, uh, startups, uh, Silicon Valley startups, and I'm interested mostly in connecting people. Uh, so in the early days, that was uh, literally building in internet infrastructure um, and then software to connect people to the internet. And then finally, when the web was kind of gotten going, uh, tools and, and processes to help people work together better, collaborate, uh, form communities, uh, gather knowledge together, things like that. Amazing. Amazing. That's been one of the, um, very cool things that you've educated and brought me up to speed on is that whole building up of the layers of communication. So we're going to get a little bit into, um, AI today and some of the most advanced technological capabilities that human humanity has, but it was really helpful to me, Pete, um, when you kind of educated me on the layers that that was built up upon, um, like starting yeah. with your, your early days of, of working with actually some of the foundational infrastructure for what we call the internet. So, um, let's take just like a few minutes and, um, talk about how the technologies that we take for granted today, um, are like, are built from the ground up, um, as kind of a, of some foundational knowledge. I know that's hard to do short, but, but yeah, just let, let's just kind of run through the, the stack that we're built upon. Okay. Um, well, uh, to, to not go too far back, I'd go back to, uh, telegraphs, uh, in the 1800s or so. Um, so back in the day, uh, people were finally stringing wires, uh, across, across countries and were able to connect, uh, basically switches at either end of them and send messages by tapping on the switch. That was how telegraph started. Um, so that, um, that created a kind of a, a wire network, uh, infrastructure that then we, uh, we stuck phones onto, uh, so phones on, allow you to pick up a microphone on one end and a speaker on the other end, uh, other end and talk at the same time, people were looking for ways to send what we would call digital information now, they, they didn't really think of it that way. But um, uh, telegram and teletype, uh, teletype writers replaced uh, telegrams, I guess. So teletype writers uh, looked like a typewriter, a big boxy, you know, typewriter. Um, but it was connected to the wires and they would send... Um, the, the ones that, that I remember, I actually used, used one, but um, the ones I'm trying to talk about are probably 50 years earlier than that. But they used uh, something called Bado code, uh, which was a five-bit binary code. Five bits has 32 variants, so you can send 26 uh, letters and, and 10 numbers and kind of get away with it. Um, and I guess literally I used one of those for when I was connected to my first computer, it was, uh, again, over a phone line, uh, but my side had a teletype writer and the other side was, uh, what we might call a mainframe nowadays. Back then it was called a mini computer. Uh, it was probably the size of a refrigerator or something like that. And, um, was a timeshare machine at the university, uh, in the town I was in. So. Um, so all of that kind of like backend stuff is still underneath the things that, that we work on now. So 
the five bit code uh, sooner or later turned into seven bit code, uh, seven bit ASCII, it's called uh, A S C I I. And seven bit ASCII allows you 128 characters, which is enough for upper case uh, letters, lowercase letters, numbers, punctuation, and um, some control characters, they call them. Um, that, that actually, we, we stuck on ASCII, and there were a couple competing standards. There was another one from IBM called uh, EBC DIC, um, but ASCII was the one that kind of won, and it's a, an odd example of kind of a imperialism or colonialism or something like that. Uh, it was kind of an American standard, and it got adapted for different countries. Different countries have letters that the U.S. doesn't have uh, with diacritical marks and things like that. So there were all kinds of hacks to add diacritical marks. Uh, at some point, decades later, we started doing uh, something called Unicode and UTFA, and that's kind of what we use now for the web. But if you peel back the layers, it's not too far deep. Uh, to get down to seven or eight bit ASCII. Um, uh, so those ASCII characters end up being the things that we type with. Uh, and uh, the early computers used something called a command line interface rather than our windows and a mouse. Uh, you would just have uh, one screen. The one screen was uh, a glass teletype. It was a glass teletype writer. So uh, the teletypewriters had paper where you could type stuff and the characters would go off to the computer and the computer would send characters back and they would print on a, on a rolling piece of paper. Literally, the only thing that got replaced there was the paper got replaced with a screen. Um, so they called them glass uh, teletypes. Um, and uh, about the same time... Uh, People started programming computers in the late 50s and the early 60s, and by the 70s or 80s, they were working on ways to um, make uh, graphical windows and things like that. Uh, it wasn't until uh, later uh, with um, the early versions of Mac OS and, and Windows where we started getting, and, and some competitors back then that, that died off, and we started getting real windows, and even those were clunky, and the early ones were were still character based. Um, instead of the the letters scrolling up the the screen on the glass terminal, um, uh, you'd have the ability to replace certain characters. But the early windows were made out of characters, uh, and um, the whole thing, you know, was was a hybrid of what we know, what we think of today as windows and and command line. So um, computers still like think and talk more or less in those uh, ASCII characters and Unicode characters. Um, the Unicode characters go from like uh, their eight bits, they go up to 16 bits and 32 bits to cover more, more characters uh, in the world. Um, uh, I was just talking to somebody the other day about uh, sustainability of computer information. So you and I work on a thing called Massive Wiki, which is uh, a way to write with fairly fairly plain text, um, pages of text uh, for a book or for a PDF uh, or for a website. Um, uh, I, I, I'm kind of the, the instigator of Massive Wiki. And um, as I was thinking through a massive wiki and how to how to make it, one of the things that was in the back of my mind was, um, heaven forbid, someday we have uh, some kind of uh, societal collapse where we we don't have access to the same level of technology uh, that we do today, and um, kind of that and an interest in uh, watching people over the past thirty or forty years. Um, watching them as they watch the previous generations of digital media uh, become unreadable because uh, if you if you're not if you don't take care to um, have the you know have the readers and writers available uh, to read the hard drives or the floppy drives or the tapes or whatever um, and and if you don't understand the coding that got used for that uh, you can actually lose things so as you know uh, as long ago as the 80s, there were people worried about 
um, digital media preservation. So that was something that I watched. Uh, I'm also a genealogy buff. So uh, I know I, I, I started with barely knowing half of my grandparents. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't really ask, start asking questions until I'd, I'd lost my both my grandparents, uh, the ones I knew about. Um, but uh, in the in the interim and with modern uh, genealogical research, uh, I used to love libraries, poking through physical libraries. But now, you know, a lot of that stuff is online uh, and much, much easier to, to sort and sift and find things through. So it's it's pretty common for me to be looking at paper records from the 1800s, uh, you know, which is not super old as as records go, but it's old enough to to notice that there are things that get saved and there are things that get lost. Uh, so um, a lot of the, the paper notes and and letters between people from back then are lost. Um, I I have uh, access to one really great uh, series of letters written by. Uh, maybe my my great great grandmother or something like that, or great 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 grandmother, uh, who was an immigrant from the Midwest to Oregon, and Oregon back in the day was literally open fields and nobody was there. Um, and she was writing letters back home. She was kind of desperately lonely, and you know she was telling uh, telling her brother about the hard work uh, her husband was doing to clear the land and plant crops and things like that. So that's that's something that's it's interesting to me. Um, I wouldn't have known about that except that uh, I did genealogical research going back, and I knew who those people were. Um, and then somebody posted on the web; uh, they were the the ones who ended up with those letters. Uh, and and thankfully, they kind of put them on the web for other people like me to find. You know, if you search for the right combination of names, you you up pops these scanned letters and, and uh, typed up letters. So that's that's a, a rare exception, though. The things that really got saved were census records and, you know, sometimes birth and death and marriage records. So um, the other thing that kind of decays over time, I've I've been able to see, and and I've got my brother kind of to thank for this. My brother ha ended up having a history, uh, uh, an interest in the history of handwriting in the U.S. He was a high school teacher and was watching um, handwriting die uh, in the past decade or so as kids started to learn computers and and forgot handwriting. Um, so he's, a he's become an amateur historian of, of handwriting and, and, and a, and a world-class expert, it turns out, uh, because he spent a lot of time and, and money and, and research digging through, you know, uh, collections and, and, uh, uh, artifacts and things like that. So from him, I know that, uh, even though the past hundred years, different styles of handwriting have been taught and learned and, and, you know, came and, and went. Uh, so there were particular kinds of handwriting for telegraph operators and particular kinds of handwriting for teachers and and um, and secretaries and, you know, clerks and in law and stuff like that. And some of those are really hard now to read uh, because, you know, people forgot that anybody ever wrote like that and it was hard to imagine and things. So, um, so with all of that kind of background of thinking of how how it's really easy to lose information even even over the course of you know a, a few generations, um, one of the things I I did when I was thinking about massive wiki and and survivability is maybe what we'll call it you know um, if if Jordan or me is writing something in uh, in two thousand and twenty whatever. Uh, will anybody be able to read it in 20 years? Will anybody be able to read it in 200 years? Will anybody be able to read it in 2,000 years? And, you know, it progressively gets uh, trickier and trickier thinking about that. So thanks for your question, Jordan. I got to go back kind of through the history of uh, digital communications and, and uh, digital representation of language. Um, Massive Wiki, purposely, I kind of built it to make sure that it was low to the ground. Um, it's, uh, the, the formatting we're using is called Markdown. So Markdown is almost just plain text. The plain text we're using, uh, if you're using just basic letters is very much like ASCII. Um, ASCII is a fairly simple, uh, seven bit binary code. Uh, and in the order of the characters in ASCII, uh, you'll find 
the numbers and then the uppercase letters and the lowercase letters in order. So, so if you wanted, you know, if you forgot everything, if the society forgot everything, um, and you had, uh, you had some binary representation of uh, a massive wiki, say that we, I, another thing that you and I will do probably is, is print the most important things on paper or even on, on durable plastic or something like that, where, you know, some of those pages will live for a long time. Um, but at some point you also want to have digital representations of things because the digital representations can be a lot smaller than the, the printed, printed versions. Um, so you can fit a lot more information. Um, those, even those digital and binary representations are really easy to figure out. You kind of from first principles, um, all the way down to if all you can read is the ones and zeros, you know, you'll notice that the ones and zeros comes in groups of eight. And then you'll notice that if you turn those into numbers, some of them, you know, seem like they're probably letters and some of them seem like they're probably numbers and some of them seem like they're, they're commas and, and periods and things like that. So you could, with not much help, um, very little help, very, very little things, um, basically from first principles, bootstrap from kind of a binary version of a massive wiki up to the thing that you and I work with today, the way that we see it, um, including all the hyperlinks and things like that. All of that stuff is, again, low to the ground and um, survivable. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> incredible. So so I met um, I met Pete through a group called Open Global Mind, and I, I met um, Open Global Mind in my search for the, the I guess, philosophy or quest um, as we were looking at how we might be able to potentially catalyze a joint venture to transform our way of being as a human species and maybe lift over, le leap over the destruction that might lie ahead into something better and not worse, was that there's, you know, amazing, heroic, good people around the world and so many incredible groups doing incredible things, but they're all currently separated and divided and they don't know each other and they don't know that each other exists and they're, they're not connected in any way and they're, they're not sharing information. And so there was, there was two fundamental, uh, technological objectives that we kind of set on the critical path, uh, five, six years ago, something like that. One was to construct a technological backbone that was able to connect up and empower um, a distributed array of diverse, autonomous, self-governing groups, but onto common data structure and language and architecture that could make sense of those things and, and give the, the distributed array of groups around the world a, a way to visualize who they were both individually and as a higher order collective. And then in addition to, uh, let's visualize that as a skeleton or a backbone to connect um, diverse parts to, then the other aspect of that was, uh, was some kind of a mind, like how, how do we know what we know? And as we're beginning to work together to try to gather up our collective inheritance of wisdom and knowledge, assuming that humanity has arrived at this place and we essentially know everything we could possibly need to know to avoid destruction and achieve a beautiful future, how do we, how do we gather up that collective inheritance into something truly durable and lasting? And then it's kind of the, the connection of groups becomes critical to the collection of our collective inheritance because our collective inheritance of wisdom and knowledge is distributed across, you know, that array of groups. And as I've traveled through, um, through Europe and, um, you know, the mountains of Asia and the mountains of South America and the, you know, plains of Africa, all of those groups know different things that's super valuable and essential to the survival of the human species. And so, so this, um, this idea of knowledge repository, durable knowledge repository, not taking for granted that we will always know what we know. So, so when we look back at history, it, it appears that human humans go through cycles where, where knowledge comes and goes. And before those collapses occur, it, it probably often looks as if our golden age will last forever and nothing could po possibly go wrong. And then pretty soon you have, you know, chaos and conflict and dark ages and the libraries are, bur are burnt down and, and it's not, you know, humanity can go through long struggles 
to regain um, what it knew, especially when the populations disconnected from each other. Like that light will reemerge in, in regions and take, you know, centuries to redevelop. And other groups in other parts of the world are completely disconnected from it. So, so that's a little bit of the basis. So, so Pete ended up being um, one of the humans in the world that, um, that I thought I felt had thought most deeply and um, intensely and correctly in a rigorous and structured way about that for many decades. And that work, um, that work went beyond thought into the actual technological creation. So, so Pete, let's, let's just talk, um, before we get into AI, since you touched on, on massive wiki and knowledge repository and kind of the underlying basis, um, when I was, when I was choosing how to publish some of the foundational work or ideas that I was trying to, um, pull together from my lifetime of, of learning, um, there was the option to put that into a book, but very early on, um, you know, one of the editors I was talking to said, a lot of people I've talked to have published static books. Um, have said they kind of regret not actually creating, you know, dynamic interlinked websites that can, you know, change and grow and be linked with, with multimedia. So, so I took a little bit of a, of a risk to um, work with Pete primarily first instead of an editor and instead of putting out, you know, polished static books to be building a dynamic living body of intensely interlinked works that's now, um, you know, well over a million words and thousands of pages. So, and, and then that body of work, like Pete said, um, not that it's inherently special, except as a, maybe a center of gravity or a kernel for other people to also be contributing wisdom and knowledge and us figuring out how to store what we know and how to connect those pieces of wisdom and knowledge. That, that currently, why don't you explain a little bit, um, about how that technology works and, you know, when I or you are, you know, writing on our individual machines, how that's, uh, linked up through GitHub, um, you know, the versioning, the storage, and then the local storage, as well as the collective and how that is important in allowing us to have, you know, the advanced internet capabilities and technologies while we have them. Um, and then how it's also accessible to any community that happens to have a local version of it stored. Uh, sure. Uh, let me, um, let's see. Uh, so the, the, there was a, a kind of a funny acronym behind the word massive. Uh, we spell massive the, the usual way now, M A S S I V E, but the, the first version of it was, uh, M A S V F. Um, uh, and that, that's kind of pronounced massive too. So that's where the, the English word comes from, but the, uh, M A in, uh, M A S V F stands for markdown. The S stands for shared. V stands for version and F stands for files. And it turns out that that's kind of a, like a minimum sweet spot, uh, for, uh, sharing sharing files and especially collaborating on files and maybe even files is the wrong, the wrong word, um, on a book, for instance. So, um, so files are something that computers have been using for a long time. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not, um, it's not a foregone conclusion that you would have files. Uh, files kind of happened, uh, in the late seventies or so. Um, before that, it was, you know, not uncommon to have just, I, there wasn't, there wasn't a way to kind of organize large, you know, small chunks and big chunks of, of, uh, images, uh, or text or things like that. So, uh, I used to write, um, home video games back in the, the early eighties. Um, and you know, the, because of because of the simplicity of the the computers built into them and the you know the early nature of the tech and stuff like that um they didn't store files internally uh you had just strings of of bits that meant you know an image or something like that um it was not uncommon for somebody like me to actually write um, a little bit of code that pulled the images out, you know, um, I, I would store images a certain way and, and, uh, I made choices because of the constraints of the system and things like that. Um, 
in and I would store them and retrieve them in a way that wouldn't necessarily work for the next game over. So files is actually kind of a big innovation. There's lots of good things and bad things about files and the file systems, the way we ended up with them. However, they got really, really standardized. So, you know, flash forward uh, 40 years or something like that, all computers can manage files and all uh, anybody who's using a computer kind of knows the concept of files. I can go find a folder or a directory and it's got files and on the files kind of map to the idea of a page or a document or something like that, or, or an image. Um, they have names, uh, they can be alphabetized, um, they can have file formats. Uh, you can tell which is a text file, which is an image file and all that kind of stuff. So just the concept of a file is actually kind of a big statement. Um, early wikis didn't really store stuff in files, they tended to store stuff in databases. So databases are again, a little bit like my video game system, um, they keep track of how they keep things on the disk uh, for various reasons of speed and efficiency and things like that. And you, you, have, a, you have to have a database program running and you talk to the, the, prog the, the database and you say, hey, find me this chunk of, of whatever, right? This wiki page. Um, so, um, so, so to kind of simplify everything and let people have direct access to each wiki page separately, I said, let's use files. Um, programmers, uh, skipping now to sharing and versioning, especially versioning, um, programmers, software developers, people who've been writing code for, you know, I've, I've been writing code for um, about 45 years. Um, and there were, you know, 45 years before that, there were people writing code. Um, in all of that time, so I guess sounds sounds crazy, but um, a long time of, of uh, uh, writing code, um, people started sharing programs back and forth because once you write a program, you can give it to somebody else. And because the computers are standardized, somebody else can run the same thing, right? Calculate the digits of pi or um, uh, sum up tallies of a financial sheet or something like that, right? That's a useful thing to be able to share these programs or apps. Um, so then it would be nice uh, when somebody gets your program, they, they see a bug, they fix a bug, or they add a feature or something like that, they're going to change the programming. Uh, computer programs are written line by line, uh, text, lines of text. Uh, in the olden days, going back history-wise, they used to be on punch cards, uh, but uh, a punch card is is kind of the same as a line uh, in text, oddly enough. Uh, and now we just use lines of text. So each line of text has different instructions for the computer and different you know numbers and and letters for variables and things like that. So developers, software developers over the years have said, you know, if you fix a bug or add a feature or something like that, I can kind of observe that your version of the program and my version of the program are very similar. They just have a few lines where they, they are changed, right? So why don't we write a program that helps us put those lines together and make one, one version that's new and better than, than both of them, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's called a revision, a revision control system or a version control system. Uh, you've got versions of files, uh, maybe multiple versions of files. And at, at this point, at this late date in, in computer programming now, it's not uncommon to have dozens of developers working on code and um, thousands of files, uh, hundreds of thousands of line, lines of code. Um, keeping track of all the versions of that and which one is the most current and which ones have been merged together and, and not merged together yet. Uh, is the ver is the the job of uh, modern generation version control systems? So, um, uh, so Pete, the, real, real yes. quick before we advance, because because it's I love um, trying to tie and triangulate knowledge together. Mm -hmm. So what what Pete's describing that over the last hundred years, let's say, um, emerged out of our efforts to increasingly build meaningful architecture into and coordinate um, functional entities in digital space. 
emerged also out of thousands of years of humanity figuring out how to build, you know, physical things. So someone would have an idea and maybe in the beginning, you know, a master builder just does it themselves. Um, pretty soon humanity goes, okay, these, these are bigger projects that need to span time and space. And so instead of having what I'm going to build in my mind as a master builder, I'm going to put what's in my mind into a set of plans and specifications that represents what we're going to build. And then once you take a set of plans and specifications, and then you go distribute it to the, the 50 different companies that are going to bring, you know, the, the roadway into reality, the roadway and bridges into reality, they each discover that there's things uh, wrong, missing gaps, things that could be improved. And so you have that same, like crucially important issue on building projects is the plans are constantly getting revised. So how do we know what the source of truth is of what we're going to build? And so, you know, in the olden days of my young life, you know, it was literally, you know, physical sheets of plans where, you know, you'd have like a color stamped on them. So you're like, okay, does everybody have the red plans today? And then you'd have to take all those back and then give everybody a new set with the blue sticker. And so you'd have these, these revisioning control systems, but. I think it's, it's really cool to look what's happened with thousands of years of humans building in the physical world. And, and then to see how without like a ton of overlap, similar things have emerged in our efforts to, to organize the digital world. And now, um, you know, many of us are trying to figure out how we put those things together to design and build the future that we want. So I just wanted to interject that tie, but, but carry on. That's a, a great, uh, great comparison. Um, and. Uh, you've edged into kind of an, a, a tricky problem there because uh, a drawing uh, is a little bit hard to compare. You know, if somebody's erased a line and, and made it a fix, it's a little bit hard to compare. Um, I'm I'm lucky. Uh, I get to live in. Actually, I I chose it. I guess uh, I I choose to chose to live in a place where a lot of stuff can get represented in text, and we have ways of representing diagrams now in text too. Um, but most of my work is, is software development or prose, uh, where you can literally just use lines of, you know, prose, lines of programming text. So, um, there were, there, there have been, there still are many version control systems. The one that gained a ton of popularity was written by, uh, Linus Torvalds, the guy behind, uh, Linux. Um, uh, he... Uh, Linus is kind of a, an interesting, interesting cat. Um, uh, he started writing his own version of Unix uh, because he wanted to kind of, um, and uh, Unix was the, the previous kind of winner of you know the, what what operating system should we use for most of the computers. Um, now that that winner is is Linux, uh, so many, many, many computers in the world, uh, especially little ones and sometimes bigger ones use Linux uh, uh, as its operating system. So uh, Linus had a lot of work to do uh, and had a, uh, ended up growing a huge team of volunteers to work on the Linux kernel, it's called the, the, the core of the, the system. Uh, and at some point, um, he got fed up with the, um, kind of a bigger story behind that, but uh, he got fed up and, and wanted to have a version control system that worked the way he, he thought it ought to. Um, to work with the team of people working with him on the kernel. Uh, so he wrote a thing called Git. Uh, and Git is a funny word. It actually kind of means a, a disabled person or something like that in, in British and English. And he meant it to, as kind of a, uh, like, this is just a like a, a piece of junk kind of. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a stupid, silly thing that we're going to use. Um, and it's not. Uh, it's a brilliant piece of coding. Uh, it's it's a really nicely designed system. It's not something that he invented all the pieces for. Uh, he picked up the pieces for what became Git um, out of a lot of computer science, you know, history. Um, there's not a lot of like like startlingly new things I think in it. But uh, as a system put together to do a purpose thing, it's it's done really well. Um, I have to say here also. Uh, any of the developers who are using Git have learned to kind of love and hate the the way it works uh, because of the way it was built and for the the audience it was built for it it grew out of the just being a tool for the kernel developers it grew out of that very quickly um, but 
uh, it's it's hard to use, it's confusing to use, um, and um, uh, internally, structurally, it's very well done, and it keeps its data nice and clean, but the the use of it by humans is a difficult thing. And maybe we'll get back uh, today or maybe another time uh, to that part of the story. Uh, Git is kind of both a blessing and a curse uh, for Massive Wiki right now. So, um, so back to Massive Wiki, Markdown, shared version files. Um, the S and the V, uh, we use different systems, but the one that we like a lot is Git. So Git uh, gives us the capability for me to be editing files, uh, maybe in Lionsburg Wiki, and Jordan to be editing files in Lionsburg Wiki, and for us to kind of both push a button and... Uh, we our computers uh, upload changes. Uh, they sync up and they actually sync up. Conceptually, they sync up in the cloud. They actually sync up on each uh, person's machine. Um, uh, each of our machines uploads and downloads, and then we can synchronize the, the lines together and, and make them make sense again. And Git does almost all of that automatically, um, which is awesome because then Jordan can edit his, his text files, I can edit my text files, and we know that Git is going to have our back and, and make it just work out, um, except when it doesn't. Uh, so, so then Markdown, maybe we'll come to Markdown real quick. Uh, in, back in the, the early days of around wikis and around blogs, blogs and wikis kind of came up at the same time. There were people like me, uh, I wrote a wiki system, um, there were people who were looking at email systems mostly and uh, the way that we wrote emails way back in the day was just plain text. There weren't any bold, there wasn't any italic. You couldn't have links and things like that. Um, a bunch of people came to that problem and said, well, I'm writing on the web now. My wiki wants to be on the web. My blog wants to be on the web. I wonder how I could make it so that we could add a little bit of, of hints or formatting or something like that into our our plain text kind of email format so that we could make links and um, and uh, you know headers and bold and stuff like that uh, without the complexity of HTML HTML you know the native language for the web uh, HTML works great but it's it's pretty the syntax word is, is pretty verbose there's a bunch of stuff that makes the text hard to read when and, and a little bit hard to write so into that, uh, things like wiki syntax, it was called, and Markdown uh, was was created. Markdown is um, a, the name. Markdown is a take off on the word markup, uh, which is the general term for uh, taking text and marking it up, kind of like an editor does with a pencil. Actually, uh, let me mark up this text and say this should be bold, this should be italic, this should be a header. So Markdown looks very, very similar to plain text, uh, and, and it's also very forgiving. So uh, you can give somebody a Markdown document with headers and, and, um, and uh, links and formatting, and they'll look at it, and they'll either copy it pretty well, or, or even if they make a mistake, uh, you, they, they'll have written some extra prose or something like that. It's really easy to go in and fix it. So Markdown is a is a very simple way to add a little bit of web style formatting to plain text, um, and it reads just like plain text. Uh, if you if somebody didn't tell you this was you know built to to turn into pretty rendered HTML, you wouldn't know it. You would just read it like like plain text, like the plain text uh, that you would see um, from a you know, 1980s email or from a 1950s memo uh, or even from a, you know, 1880s receipt or something like that. It looks, it looks the same. You know, there's nothing special about it. Unlike HTML, which would be kind of a, you know, a reach. If I showed somebody from 1880 an HTML page, they'd go, uh, I, what happened to this? Somebody like ran it through a shredder or something and tried to put it back together half, halfway. Um, if I showed them Markdown, they would say, oh, I get it. This is a memo. Cool. I've seen this before. I can I can actually type something a lot like this on my typewriter. So, so there we have it. Markdown uh, shared version files uh, is kind of so, building so, blocks for. Massive and I, just just to just to throw one more thing in there. Um, back to 
the need for advanced technology, but also low to the ground um, persistence and recoverability um, through potential cataclysms. Um, just to to plus one on that, you know, it took Pete um, an hour to teach me the basics of Markdown, and then you know, basic um, prompts and text and AP. How do I do this? You know, kind of unfolds a little bit of the mystery, but it's it's something that. Um, within an hour, somebody can kind of have the basics and, and be writing their first little document. So it's, it's simple. Um, and I just want to emphasize that because Pete and I are going to be <laughs> trying to get collaborative writers as we're going to discuss to be learning these languages and, and collaborating with us to unfold, unfold knowledge. So, okay. So that's Markdown, another foundational thing. Let me, uh, so we, we were spending a lot of time talking about sus sustainability, survivability and being low to the ground. And that's, it's important for, you know, potential, potential things in the future. Maybe, maybe, uh, cataclysms will happen. Maybe they won't. Um, the other thing that, that does, that's valuable even now is that, um, none of those, none of those pieces I invented for my wiki system, Massive Wiki. Uh, Markdown has been around and used in many, many, many systems. Uh, sharing and versioning with Git has been around and used by probably millions of people. Uh, files have been used by tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people in a, a huge variety of, of computer systems. So, um, so while I can take a little bit of credit for kind of collecting those and curating out of the, you know, all the different kinds of things, you know, do we use a file or a database? Do we use um, HTML or XML or uh, restructured text? Or, you know, how are we, do we, do we even need to do versioning, things like that? I can take some credit for kind of curating those together, but it's also not something that's um, in obvious to somebody else. Uh, if somebody said, huh, I want to keep files, or I, I want to keep information. I want to keep books, for instance, on computers. I want to be able to share them, and uh, uh, I want to be able to work with multiple people or something like that. Or very similarly, um, I, uh, I want to have a personal knowledge management system that keeps track of everything that I've learned. Uh, or, you know, I want a blogging system, or uh, I'm doing... Um, uh, I'm doing a chat system and I need people to be able to do a little bit of formatting. All of those use cases, one of the obvious answers to the, the question of how we're going to use the technology, what, what technology choices are we going to make, how are we going to curate technology together to, to work, um, often the answer is markdown and often the answer is git and often the answer is files. So, um, so it is, uh, uh, Obsidian, for instance, is a personal knowledge management system that uh, grew up kind of at the same time and in parallel with Massive Wiki. It's gotten a lot more popular, actually, than Massive Wiki now. Um, uh, convergently, they made the same technology choices. You know, let's, let's have a, a directory of files. Let's let people have subdirectories in it. Let's make those files marked down. They could have chosen to do it in a database, um, they, and you know there were previous systems like Evernote or something like that where the the back end was kind of hidden to the user. Um, uh, Obsidian made some different choices and came up with something that is very much aligned with Massive Wiki, and and it was by design that I wanted to work on information systems that other people would guess how they worked or guess you know when they're doing technology. Um, I, I would do it kind of the same way. So what that allows, um, it allows that survivability into the past, but into the future, it also means that uh, when somebody makes a decision, a technology decision in some other context, a much different context, they're likely to come up with um, similar or compatible choices. And so, you know, the the cross um, cross compatibility across distributed, decentralized. Uh, technology choices is something that's incredibly useful now and incredibly useful into the future. Yeah. So one, one example, just tying those specifically together, um, and talking about interoperability around reasonably wise common sense, uh, architectures that we're trying to, is, is it gives us the, so for instance, we have the Lionsburg wiki whose backend is massive wiki developed by Pete on the front end on my interface with massive wiki. 
we can choose which tools to use. So it just so happens that based on the current suite, because of what Pete just described and the general rightness of the architecture and design, Obsidian happens to be a really amazing and easy to use way to interface with, with Massive Wiki. So that's actually what I'm currently writing in is Obsidian and then using the push and pull system through Git to, uh, to manage the Massive Wiki. Let, let's talk, Pete, a little bit about, um, let, let's go from, it looks like we're going to end up at AI last. Um, let's go from, if, if that's reasonably complete, it's not filling any gaps, but let's talk a little bit about, um, why Git was revolutionary for people in distributed locations around the world to be able to create a shared thing that actually is coherent and works. Um, and why that is somewhat of a magical milestone in human history, just the ability to do that. So let's talk a little bit about that for what that made possible in software um, why that's so powerful. And then, then let's advance into why we think that's important, maybe also to do with human language and knowledge where it's not done as much. Um, sure. That's a, that's a great, um, segue. Um, and part of the story there is, uh, another thing called GitHub. So, uh, Git was an interesting beast. Uh, it, it was architected to be decentralized and peer to peer if you needed it to be. Um, it was also, uh, you can still actually, you can still, op uh, cooperate with other people, collaborate with other people, uh, just using Git and email. Uh, so if you're at the end of a, a lousy internet, internet connection, or you live on a yacht and you have internet connection once in a while, you can actually still collaborate with Git just fine. Um, uh, which, uh, which is, which is different than the immediately preceding things. Uh, the version control systems before that typically wanted everybody to connect to the same system, the same centralized server to exchange, you know, files and make sure. So the centralized server could do things like um, simple-minded uh, gatekeeping, basically, you know. In the olden days, we used to check out files. Uh, so uh, I would say, huh, I want to work on module XYZ today. Um, uh, hey, version control system. Let me check out X, Y, Z. Just just the way you check out books from a library, if that makes any sense to anybody anymore, I guess. Um, uh, when I was a kid, and, and I think when Jordan was a kid still, um, uh, I didn't go to the web to read books. I didn't use a Kindle. I went to a building called the library. <laughs> um, and I went and found the book and brought it up to the front desk and said, can I check this out? And then she would, uh, you know, the person behind the counter, she or he would, would uh, you know make notes and in, in the system give me a card in the book and then I would take the book away. So we used to check out files the same way, but instead of a, a library attendant, it would be a server. And then and then the way that collaboration worked is uh, Jordan said, "Huh, I want to work on X Y Z today." Uh, he would go to the central server and the central server would say, "Dude, X Y Z is checked out by this guy Pete Kaminsky. You know, go by, by the." him if you really need it. Uh, otherwise, wait until he checks it back in. So Git was different <clears throat> and allowed people to work kind of asynchronously and yet synchronized through, um, through not necessarily centralizing system. So you could sync with your buddy peer-to-peer. Um, -peer. You could sync with uh, maybe a few buddies over an e email list or something like that. It's a wonderful thing. Um, it turns out that uh, for collaboration, sometimes you actually do want something kind of in the middle. So people invented. Let's define. This. Let's, def let's define those not obvious terms um, for people okay. that, that might not be working like this of synchronous and asynchronous. So so let's just take a brief detour into talking about synchronous work and communication, mm -hmm. asynchronous work and communication, the <laughs> blend, and why as we're trying to work with people around the world, we're discovering how crucial this is to have like that wise mediated balance between synchronous and asynchronous synchronous collaboration. Um, and, and yes, and, 
uh, the centralized mediated versus and, and decentralized. Sometimes you want yes. decentralized and sometimes you want to centralize for various reasons. So, so, so there's is. like a, so there's, there's this concept of, um, like the wise, right thing, and it usually relates to balance. And mm -hmm. so, um, there's all these themes around like, um, let's work completely remotely and never be together. And then you discover, okay, that has limitations. What we really want is to be together the right amount of time. So it's like, and then it's annoying that we're always having to be together to work. So it's like, let's go asynchronous. Well, then you discover that there's limitations to that. So you actually want the right amount of synchronicity. There, yes. The last three years, there's been a massive right to push towards decentralization because of the tendencies towards totalitarian control and abuse and co-option of systems. So there was this idea, let's decentralize everything. Same thing, you get too far in that direction. You go, okay, well, actually we want to be right centralized, right, you know, right on the balance. And so all of these pendulums we're talking about are, I think, really almost exactly the issues that we're debating as a human species on how we're going to organize and govern ourselves into the future and how we're going to balance the the competing capabilities that each of the poles affords while protecting ourselves from the excesses that um, can occur if, if we don't wisely balance. That, that balance is really tricky. And I, I, I don't know, maybe it's not. Um, it's, it is it can be really frustrating. I guess when you're stuck on one of the poles, uh, you get really frustrated um, and you say, I don't want this pole anymore. I have to go to the other one because yeah. all of my problems are because it's centralized or all of my problems are because it's decentralized. And that's not true. Like you say, it's it's a blend of the things that you want. Um, I guess it's it's hard not to be tempted to swing away far from a pole. And that's yeah. the hard part of it. Um, but but when you start doing things and when you have the capability to do both kinds of modalities, uh, you realize, oh, these are the times I want to be centralized or synchronous. These are the times I want to be decentralized or asynchronous. So synchronous uh, just means kind of like synchronization, things like that, the, the same word. Um, synchronous means at the same time. Uh, so right now you and I are in synchronous communication. We're talking to one another. Um, asynchronous communication, uh, the A part of that means opposite or, or uh, without, um, means that uh, asynchronous is like email. Um, I can send you an email. Uh, you don't have to read it at the same time I'm writing it. Um, and uh, you can get back to me at your convenience. Uh, so, And I know to wait for it. It doesn't freak me out that you, know, you didn't say something right away. So um, uh, I think... I don't want to get too far away from um, the the recentralization of of Git work, um, but if we can talk just real briefly and maybe come back to it later, it turns out that um, even if you there's there's an interesting blend of uh, synchronization and or uh, synchronization synchronous synchronous and asynchronous work and centralization and decentralization. Um, if you and I are working fairly decentralized on a set of files. Uh, it's still it's still convenient and and useful and and right for you and me to have a more synchronous conversation in a chat someplace. Um, hey Jordan, these are the things I'm working on today. Um, so if you know if you know what I'm working on, you can kind of steer away from what I'm working on, or you can let me know, um, hey, Pete, when you get into that part of the of the book, these are the things that I needed, I wanted to add. Um, could you help me add some of those, you know, at least book, bookmarks for it, and they'll come in later and, and put them and make sure they kind of go with your flow. So um, so we find, uh, uh, we, we end up in multimodal um, uh, collaboration, cooperation. Where one of the one of the parts of our collaboration is very asynchronous, and it turns out then it's important to balance that at the same time with some kind of semi-synchronous uh, coordination. So it's it's kind of interesting that balance happens even it's not one or the other and you switch. Uh, we end up blending a couple together at the same time. It's uh, tough to to learn that. I guess again, it's the poles. You know, you, you say. Um, I, I, I want to be completely decentralized or I want to be completely centralized. Yeah.
So what, just real quick, what in response to that need, in addition to setting up the Lionsburg wiki, um, which, which is a more of a long-term play, a, a knowledge repository that we can work collaboratively on. We handled the need, the emergent need for that semi-synchronous, you know, relatively more rapid, but not in-person communication by also setting up a, a Lionsburg chat system that those of us that are more closely collaborating use. And so, so basically what we're, what we're moving towards is this idea. We'll, we'll later then talk about the addition of AI to the repository of knowledge. But so we end up with, with really a, a technology stack that's needed in order to enable us to function and collaborate as a human species from, from the deeper from the deeper and more pers persistent and structured backbone platform that we talked about earlier that can connect up and make visible um, the distinct and diverse parts of the body, let's say, to the, the more static and per persistent knowledge repositories that we're thinking about how that knowledge lasts even over centuries or millennia and in good times and through cataclysm. And then, and then, but that backbone that's a little heavier and the knowledge that's more persistent needs to be mediated by, you know, the ability to kind of communicate around the world on the fly with some middle level of synchronicity that's not a phone call and that's not the, the longer term stuff. And so for that, we, we additionally created a, um, a Lions for chat system that will be continuously improving. So, so it's, it gets back to this idea that it's not either or, but you actually have to intelligently design, figure out how human beings kind of work together and then intelligently design and build up the tech stack that enables um, collaboration of the force of good around the world. Um, and another interesting thing is that um, as, you, as you collaborate, uh, we end up working, uh, you end up, calling a, 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 an audible or something like that you you, you, you flag um, hey I think this is something that we could do better more synchronously or you know it's okay if we we go less less synchronously so even if we have a chat system sometimes uh, you know we'll say you know there's a lot of stuff to talk through here and it's going to take forever to type through it uh, let's get on the phone or let's get on zoom or Google meet or whatever uh, let's chat synchronously and go all the way synchronous get stuff done and then, you know, move back down the, the ladder of synchronicity. So, okay. So, so in that channel, you, you go back and forth, you go back and forth. Okay. And I want to just tie a couple things in, cause we're like, um, it took us a long time to figure these things out. And so I want to just <laughs> weave a couple of these threads. Okay. So, so Pete just mentioned that, that we're communicating, we're, we're creating long-term works of enduring value, let's say that, that are informing functions. Um, on these more persistent systems, we're collaborating and intermediating our work together on that versus via chats systems that enable flow. There's, I don't think we want to talk about it too much today, but there's a reason why we want to use a structured chat system and not just be all texting each other because the language and the structure of how the, the chat is gathered can actually then be queried to inform the longer term stuff, right? So if I, if I send Pete a text and that's how we're communicating, then in the future, if anybody wanted to pick up an, on any of those threads or that work, cause that's all generating knowledge that's not obvious and has taken us hundreds of hours of collaboration and come to having that stored in, in reasonably persistent ways within a, within a structured environment where that interaction is, is unflowing. Unflowing is not a word where that interaction is unfolding and flowing. Um, that's creating in itself a body of knowledge that is able to be interfaced with and queried, especially now that we're adding in AI capabilities. You can, we could ask. So we've been chatting for a year or whatever. We can ask AI, Hey, look through the chat system and find all the places where Pete has discussed the issue of synchronous and asynchronous communications with any of the groups. That AI bot can go find those 10 top places where that's been discussed. 
pull those out and then summarize them for the user with what's, you know, most important about it. And so the way that the way that we discipline ourselves to communicate when we collaborate, while it can feel annoying because I prefer <laughs> iMessage or whatever, and it's just easier, it, it's everything in iMessage is not doing the same thing as what we're attempting to do in forging the true ways that we do collaboration and governance around the world. And it also, um, I think, will eventually get into the mechanisms of transparency and accountability and decision making and all those things where we're not... Uh, we're, we're wanting to move beyond, you know, concealed knowledge and side room deals and politicking into like, hey, AI, um, what happened and how were the decisions made that brought us to, you know, that brought us to this point? Okay, so, so that's, um, so Pete and I are going to be encouraging people to work with us to learn about collaborative writing using Massive Wiki and GitHub that we'll get back to in a second. And we're going to be encouraging the people working with us and maybe even getting um, more structured and like refusing to respond to people um, who text us to make sure that we're training ourselves to be communicating in a structured environment so that our ongoing work together is actually useful and informative to current and future generations. And then Pete also mentioned that then we're going to switch and and talk on a Zoom call, let's say, or um, in this case, um, in a digital studio. So that's where now these inbreaking capabilities of AI driven transcription are absolutely magical. So what you'll find on the Lionsburg wiki that we're just piloting now, this is the fifth episode, I guess, something like that. But AI, as we talk today is generating a full transcript of this conversation. That conversation is then going to end up probably being a, um, somewhere between a 12 and 20,000 word document on the Lionsburg wiki. So you'll have this, um, this live and engaging, hopefully, um, conversation between two individuals that you can want, but that's hard to query as a, as a verbal and visual object. But when that gets transcribed by AI and uploaded into the permanent knowledge repository tomorrow, when we update and train the AI on that and someone queries, Hey, um, where has Pete talked with anybody about these things? This particular conversation, likely with timestamps, can get pulled up so that people can zoom right into this section of the of the conversation. So as we're working to gather up our our collective knowledge and wisdom, these podcasts become so much more because you're not having to listen to two hours in order to find these these subjects. It's like when, when has Jordan or Pete talked with any other intelligent or wise person about X topic? And we'll be able to zoom right into those places where you can pull up, you know, that five minute snippet on what the piece of knowledge that some human somewhere in the world, you know, might find useful to help them through a problem or opportunity. So, so I guess what I'm trying to trace with this is back to this idea that we have to actually intelligently architect and stack up and align these technologies in order for our system of collaboration and governance to work as we even think through not only how we balance this, but how we switch between them. Then we're trying to architect in the background also how in that switching, the back end of, of what we're creating together is getting tied back into that whole um, corpus of work, let's say. Okay, so that was a long deviation from GitHub. On um, from so we, so we were we were ten minutes ago. We were on the the transition from Git um, on your yacht and asynchronous to GitHub, and the the pros and cons and benefits of GitHub and and why that you know is, was an important piece that changed things. So people invented this thing called GitHub, and conceptually, it's it's kind of like a social network for. Um, it's actually a social network for software more than it's a social network for software developers. So the idea was, uh, uh, hey, you know, when you when you're working with a team, maybe the and and you want to do peer to peer uh, Git, uh, maybe that uh, your your friend's computer is offline. Uh, she's you know she's turned off her computer and she's gone to bed. Um, or, uh, you know, maybe their internet is down or something like that, or maybe they're on a yacht uh, and they haven't turned on their, their uh, set receiver yet. So 
um, so the idea was, how about if we we set up a a central a hub uh, for uh, talking Git stuff? Um, uh, we'll have uh, uh, things called repositories on the GitHub server, and it'll be a central source of truth for what uh, what the you know what the software is. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, everybody still has their own copy of the software, and they have through Git they have a, a history of the changes to it, and everybody's syncing up together, maybe peer to peer, usually through Git, GitHub. Um, uh, but there's at least one place where you can kind of reliably go to um, and make sure that you know their their files aren't screwed up their computers online stuff like that so that was kind of the idea of github um, and then a few kind of minor additions to what github does uh, made it um, explosively uh, capable for uh, in igniting an open source revolution so uh, so one of those things is um, kind of access control um, uh, Git itself doesn't have an idea. It it will talk to anybody you connect to, um, and only the people that you connect to. So it's you know um, you you have control of who's accessing what software. But in a big team of you know three people, five people, ten people, twenty people, hundred people, it's like how do I make sure that I'm connecting to the right team members and not connecting to other people? Uh, if you set that up on GitHub you just add people to the list. These are the people that can read this. These are the people that can read and write to it. Problem solved. Uh, once you have, you know, once you have a uh, hundred of my repos up in GitHub and a hundred of her repos and uh, a dozen of theirs and, you know, a thousand of theirs, pretty soon you've got this large collection of software. Uh, even before GitHub, we had a, a tradition of open source licensing where uh, it it was obvious. It made sense that uh, for maybe some software you want to keep close to your your chest, or you want to license it to other people. You say you can use this, but you can't make copies of it. Um, the flip side of that is open source is the idea that hey, if I write software and it's okay to share it with other people, I don't need to make money off of it or you know license it or something. I don't I don't need to make a commercial agreement with people for them to use it and and importantly, improve it. Um, I'll put it. I'll put it up. Uh, I'll put it someplace, and it'll have an open source license. Uh, open source license means, hey, you can take this and use it. And different open source licenses have different different uh, conditions. Some some of them say you can use it, um, you can read it, but please don't change it, and please don't give it to other people. Uh, the more permissive ones and the more usual ones say things like. Hey, you can use this. Uh, you can't if you make changes to it and and make it worse or or break it somehow, make it so that it's dangerous somehow. Uh, you can't redistribute it to other people, saying it's it's from me. You have to say that you've made those changes. Um, some open source licenses say you can make changes to this and you can give those changes to other people, but uh, you can only give them those changes. Um, I, I, sometimes it's you can some licenses are you can give them to them for whatever reason and they can use it to make money. Um, some of the licenses say you can give it to them, but they can't make money off of it. Or they you can give it to other people and they have to respect the same kind of um, conditions that I put on the software. So we'll have to We're go back real, and yeah. So so real quick. Um, we're, we're getting into another layer of the stack of how humanity works together. And, and I, we could probably categorize what we're talking about right now under the notion of what we called in the old world, intellectual property that's going to, that's getting redefined. Right. And so, so let's say that, that Pete makes some code. There's this idea in law that, that Pete as the one who wrote that is the owner of that code, right? That's his and anybody who uses it needs to, um, you know, pay him or whatever. And, and what Pete's talking about is, you know, that's great. And it's also great if, if Pete wrote that to be useful to himself and humanity, 
and it's useful to a thousand other software developers who are also creating useful things. And they're continuously improving that thing and feeding back to Pete the, the improvements of it. You get an entire different kind of synergy across an ecosystem of, of these different tools, let's call it. It's like, so if, if a whole community is continuously improving the tools and processes by which creation occurs, there's a completely different value to Pete versus trying to protect and market one by one that piece of software. So, so in the Lionsburg system, you'll see the, the idea of the Lionsburg commons, let's call it, um, that that's kind of intended to be a next generation thought through the notion of intellectual property and co-creation and who and how we steward the products that come forth through our work together. Um, so just putting a flag in that, I guess, for a, for a timestamp, probably for a later discussion, we could have with a couple of people on the future of intellectual property and why it's so crucial to transform the way we view that and, and work together around, around IP. Um, uh, commons is, is maybe a good way. Intellectual commons is, is kind of a good opposite to intellectual property and yeah. carving, you know, carving ideas is especially bizarre but ca even carving up land um and making it private land property um it's got it's got good things and it's got some really bad things uh so so, um, so we're we're toying really deeply with this um with this idea of stewardship that um all these domains there's so you could imagine that on one end there's um pure own pure control by ownership and then on the other side, you have a, you have the tragedy of chaos and commons and nobody taking care of anything and, and chaos and free for alls. And then, and then again, on those poles, like maybe we don't want the worst parts of the excesses and injustices of either one of those. So we're, so we're shooting for, okay, what are the deepest, the deepest and wisest spiritual guiding principles around what is what is um what we consider ours or what is temporarily within our control during our brief sojourn here on earth and the dip deepest principle that that we can kind of find encapsulated in a word is something like stewardship that all these domains do need to be actively stewarded they do need decisions made about them but those decisions may be based on deeper spiritual principles and justice and stewardship and multi-generational thinking and collaborative well-being rather than kind of individual and local self-optimization and control without going, you know, to the other extremes that also cause society to fail. There's a, um, it's an interesting time to live in. Uh, just maybe as a, another small note on, on this, uh, property commons thing. Um, there's a, a term tragedy of the commons. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, private property. Um, they're, they're interesting poles. Uh, they're like very polar um, positions. And I just wanted to note that neither one of those is kind of where humanity has lived for most of its time on Earth. Um, uh, people, uh, communities naturally steward commonses. Uh, so a tragedy of the commons is, it's, it's an almost an artificial creation of the, the guy who thought it up. Um, it's something that, that doesn't happen unless there's not community around it. Community is just steward commons naturally. So there's not stewardship. Like it, yeah, if the community is right. operating properly in accordance with timeless wisdom and values and proactively stewarding and acting as guardians of the collective good that they're co-stewarding, then the tragedy of the commons doesn't occur. It's when it's almost the the abdication of responsibility and authority, no, no organization, nobody cares, no, no stewardship, no guardianship that, um, you know, the, the, the vulnerable thing is trampled upon by those seeking their own self-interest, let's say. And, and similarly, um, all the way capitalist private property and leaseholding and, and, uh, rent seeking, all that kind of stuff, that's, uh, it, it's hard to it's hard to think of it this way, kind of in our society. But that's kind of a um, it's it's not a normal thing. That's not the uh, natural state of things. That's not necessarily the wise, right choice for humanity. 
it's a you know it's a uh, it's a historical happenstance that we've gotten so concentrated uh, that way too. It, just as a just as a quick anecdote on where I've seen that, um, it seems like a really old concept, but as I've, um, as again, I've wandered through the more tribal areas of the world, for instance, and, and communing with, with Maasai people, um, they had this very free, um, nomadic existence that was, um, like, like indigenous peoples around the world, but if it, it, it's not a, it's not a chaotic, um, it's a very carefully constructed millennial old pattern based existence of, of stewardship that, that moves and aligns with the earth. And so just over the last, over the last decades, um, Western civilization and corporations and, um, certain forces have come in with the idea of blessing them with the gift of private property which pens them into a small square that they then have to fence off that then disrupts all the flows of the animals that the whole cycle is dependent on. And so you end up with just massive destruction across culture and natural patterns and all these things flowing from the blessing of getting to own your little patch of the earth rather than um, exist upon it in a different way. And so again, there's, it's like back to these poles, um, you know, then you have this, the, the very stupid responses to these kinds of discussions that are like, well, obviously we can't go back to that and blah, blah, blah. And you end up with these, um, you know, these dumb false dichotomies where what humanity needs to be doing is seeking the higher wisdom of, you know, not, yeah, not, um, not tearing itself apart through stupid false dichotomies that don't need to exist and pursuing wiser solutions. Okay. So we're building up the stack, um, accidentally through this conversation, but we, we talked about, you know, backbone and persistent knowledge repository and active communication and that active communication forming valuable information that needs to be cross pollinated back into the system. And now we're getting into the fact that that co-creation, that, that ongoing collaboration and communication is co-creating knowledge and code and projects and things that we have to figure out how we collaboratively steward or own, and that gets us into the realm of property and maybe commons and discerning what things that we co-create exist in a commons that we're continuously improving for the upliftment and betterment of all and, and across the array of things, what things, um, you know, like the shirt I'm wearing or, you know, my pen, we don't really consider in the commons and I'm kind of, you know, going to take care of this and use it. So, so there's this whole array of different types of things that we use to collaboratively create. And so, so the, um, you know, and I think we should systematize these things. So the Linesburg system of intellectual property aims at going, okay, let's revisit this all from the standpoint of spiritual wisdom and first principles and figure out as Pete and I create together, create something for the benefit of the people that we want to serve, you know, are Pete and I owning it 50, 50? You know, do, does Pete own it 60% and I own it 40% because he's worried about control and thought of it first? Or are we placing this in the commons and trying to get other people to continuously improve it with us in service of the whole we're trying to lift up? And there's a whole kind of nuanced array. So, so that's a whole other um, podcast we could do sometime. Okay, so we only have like 20 minutes left. Let's go to... Um, Let's just quickly touch, let's quickly touch back on what um, GitHub made possible for software without taking too much time on it. And then let's go, let's go into collaborative writing and, and knowledge generation and our observation that, that maybe that breakthrough that happened in technology, we should, we can and should apply to our, our co-creation of artifacts of wisdom and knowledge that could be beneficial to humanity. And let's maybe shoot for like five, 10 minutes here and then spend, spend the last little uh, section on, on brief dive into AI and maybe come back to that in our next podcast. Sounds great. Uh, where we left off was uh, tens, hundreds, thousands, and ultimately hundreds of thousands of millions, probably tens of millions of, of software packages up in GitHub. Uh, so it ended up forming a kind of a centralized marketplace for ideas is a bit of a strong word, but uh, 
applied ideas uh, is actually a good way to say it. So if you need uh, some kind of software that does something, you could go to this software emporium slash social network for software. It's never really been a social software for people as much as so software, a social network for, for software. Um, and find software that was useful. You could grab it, improve it, put it back, uh, give it to the maintainers, uh, uh, grab it, keep it keep it away from the maintainers and just improve it maybe, uh, depending on, on the politics and, and the, uh, the nature of, of collaboration. So um, uh, there was a, an innovation in there where um, uh, before GitHub, the way that you would collaborate on software is you'd see a, uh, something that was open source or there was actually a time when we didn't even have the, the idea of open source. People just shared software around and, and we, didn't, you know, we didn't even think that it was you know, possibly property. Um, you would just share. Um, but by the time GitHub came around, there was actually licenses and open source and things like that. So you would share your, your open source, um, but you wouldn't make it easy for somebody to work with you. Um, not because you didn't want them to, just because there wasn't um, a, a mechanism for that. So the mechanism for um, saying, hey, I found a bug in your, in your code and I fixed it, um, or hey, I, I've got some ideas, I'd like to add some features to your code, the way that you used to do it was you'd email somebody, you'd try to find their email address, you'd email them, you'd say, I have this idea, or I fix, you know, I want to fix a bug, is it okay if I fix a bug, all that kind of stuff. It was a permission first model, um, which makes sense, you know, somebody's got a nice lawn, you want to say, hey, do you mind if, do you, not, do you mind if I put some decorations in your nice lawn, you know, or maybe a garden, I guess, a, a park or something like that. Um, you know, hey, this t Ms. Stewart of the park, could I put some decorations up? And she might say yes, she might say no. Um, it turns out, since software is infinitely duplicable, um, it's not like a park, uh, I can improve a piece of software or I can uh, damage a piece of software uh, without damaging the original. Um, so it's not like a park. It's like we've duplicated the park or the garden. Um, GitHub did an interesting thing. They said, uh, and, and the mechanism is, the, the technical name for this mechanism is, I'm going to call it fork and pull. Um, there's actually another meaning of fork, too, that we might get to someday. Um, I call it the big F fork. This is little f fork. Um, fork in the GitHub context just means I want to clone it. I want to I make a duplicate of the, of the park or garden. Um, and then I'm going to make changes to it. I'm going to dig it all up and make it terrible. <laughs> Um, I'm going to turn it into, uh, from, a, from a park, I'm going to turn it into a garden. Um, or I'm going to turn it into a park that has better decorations and, and more fun uh, places for the kids to play than the original. So with any of those, um, some more than maybe others I might be in, uh, prone to, but I can go back to the original, orig uh, original um, maintainer through what's called a pull request, I can say, hey, look at my changes. Uh, I've changed your thing. I've made it better or worse. I think it's better. You might think it's better. Uh, do you want to pull those changes into your copy, your main copy of the, the overall project? And so we went from permission first to um, modification first, changes first, and ask for permission later. Uh, and this sounds crazy in physical terms because there's no way you'd want to tear up somebody's lawn or their park or garden or something like that without asking them first. But for software, it doesn't make a difference, actually. And yeah. um, it makes it a lot easier for the maintainer of the software. Instead of, instead of having an idea, I'm, I'm going to make some fixes or changes and, or fix some bugs, can I do that? The maintainer is like, well, do you know what you're doing? What are they going to look like? Am I going to like them? You can do all of those changes and then give it back to the maintainer. And instead of the maintainer going, I don't know if I should give you permission to start doing that or not. It's like, I get to make the choice as maintainer whether or not I want to pull in those changes. Yeah. They're done already. Um, maybe I'll tweak yeah. them a little bit. Maybe I'll cherry pick the ones and the others. So that created a, an explosion of open source software development. Yeah. So this is an unbelievable human invention, right? Because it's, it's like, um, to tie it again back to the architecture, engineering, construction industry, 
you can have a master builder and you try to carefully select which master builder you're going to give permission to design and build your house. And then you hope you like it. Um, recently humanity started to do things like design competitions where it's like, Hey, we're going to build a new university in town. Um, Hey, architecture firms around the world, um, on this date, submit your very best ideas at, you know, 2% conceptual completion. Right. And then we're going to, we're going to narrow down that hundred to the five that we want to have advanced their plans to 10%. Then we're going to accept one. So, so let's imagine that's getting again, instead of like each architecture firm interviewing and asking for permission to do the valuable work, they just all get to make the best possible thing that they can pitch the ideas. And then you can have a, a vetting process and incorporation process. This is, this is really magical because on top of that initial kind of thing that happens, then once you have the original product. It's the same thing happening in constant perpetuity where anyone with a design, an idea of how to make that world a better place, so to speak, can voluntarily and of their own free accord organize themselves and the resources they need to do that and then propose it back to the community. And if they get it accepted by the community of stewards that's guarding that commons, let's say, um, then that makes that thing better for everyone using it. So the, the exponential acceleration of quality and potential is, is almost unimaginable. Um, I think we should leave GitHub. Before we do, I want to mention that um, GitHub uh, was an amazing invention in the world. It's been a wonderful thing. Um, it's beginning to be, uh, uh, in, in some ways, uh, maybe a little bit more enclosed or a little bit more commercial than, than we might like. Um, I can go into a lot of detail about that later. But I wanted to mention that it's an example of something we call a Git Forge. Um, forge is the generic name for that, more or less. Um, and there are other other Git Forges. Some of them are much much uh, more community minded, kind of. Uh, so uh, one of those is Codeberg. Another is GitLab. Another one is SourceHut. There are also self hostable um, Git Forges. Uh, probably the biggest one is called Git T, um, uh, G I T uh, E A. So um, GitHub has been an amazing and wonderful thing, like you said. It's a, it was a huge innovation in the world, and uh, now we don't always. Sometimes we we choose GitHub for various reasons, and sometimes we choose something else. Okay, let's let's just touch um, let's touch briefly into AI, um, just to give a glimpse of what will become um, another next podcast we could do. <laughs> um, so let's imagine that we have progressed in this conversation from backbone for the force for good through all these different layers of the stack up to the idea of these collaborative repositories, um, in GitHub traditionally of computer code, but now we're talking also about using the same tools and technologies to bring forth knowledge. So you can imagine just like there's all these repositories of computer code we're moving towards a place where there will be all these unique, decentralized, yet coordinatable and mutually improvable repositories of knowledge. AI brings an amazing capability to the human species because it's able to look across those repositories of knowledge and make sense of them and, and bring forth good and useful things from them. And then we're, we're also developing fractal AI capabilities, for instance, where we now have um, multitude, multiple levels of AI capabilities interfacing with the Lionsburg Wiki, for instance, that's able to have varying levels of creativity. So we can now, we can now query and say, okay, um, according to the Lionsburg Wiki, um, what are some likely patterns for um, human governance and economy and, you know, over the coming generation and an AI can make sense of those millions of words of writing and, and bring back some useful sources and summaries. And we're moving towards a back to this, um, right decentralization and centralization issue. We're moving towards a, towards a era and a design where our, our current hypothesis hypothesis through Lionsburg is we're very close to the ability to match up individual organizations with their own dynamic knowledge repositories, let's call them, with their own localized AIs that can both make sense of their own 
private repositories without peeking over the walls at other repositories that people might want to keep, you know, keep private while at the same time being able to, you know, contextualize that with what's happening really across the world and make sense of that all. So I, I guess I just open it up for, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the leading layer of the tech stacks we're building and, um, you know, feel free to comment on that as much as you would like that here today and then leave off wherever you'd like. And we can, we can pick up, uh, with a deeper discussion on AIs and its opportunities and threats. I think, uh, that, that's a great, uh, uh, great, uh, overview. Uh, that was a great overview, Jordan. Um, uh, I think you you did something interesting there. Um, you said uh, make sense of, uh, and uh, it's it's something that we've never had before. We've got the ability to have something that understands language, look over a corpus of a million words, and pick out the the uh, in context. You know, in context of a, a question where I've expressed something in in human language, or you've expressed something in human language maybe even a different language than English, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, maybe a, over a corpus of, of a language that I don't know or something like that. Um, the tools, uh, the AI tools are able to discern and perceive what what's made, uh, what those corpuses are made of, and it can look for hot spots that make sense, right? Um, I have to say there was uh there's a i think she's a linguist uh, emily bender said something really interesting recently um she said the outputs of these large language models don't actually they're not made sense they don't make sense um it's human uh, uh humans that make sense of it so what the the tool can do is find the things that seem relevant um and I, I struggle this, with this too. A lot of times it's hard not to say, um, or maybe maybe a better way to say that, we don't have language yet. We don't have language for what's happening when an AI is thinking or deciding or seeing or understanding or making sense. Uh, we just don't have the word for it. So we end up using a, a human word. You know, the, right. It understands the language um, is something that I say all the time. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm reminded by some of my friends, uh, Hey Pete, it's actually not really understanding. Um, it's just doing kind of a statistical relevance thing that the only language we have for it is understand or make sense. Um, so the thing to, the, the thing to remember is that they're, they're not yet smart in the way humans are. Um, on the flip side, they are, uh, capable of, automated i'm going to use this word understanding because i don't have a better one understanding of of uh large swaths of language right millions of words at a time are like child's play to it it's like yeah of course i can kind of grasp all of that and i can tell you what the interesting bits and and, and bobs are of of it you know so it's a super wonderful time to to be around and um uh, another another kind of uh, language expert who's been studying systems, Ethan Mollick. Uh, just today, I was he was he wrote a, a a summary of where we are. He says a year later, um, since ChatGPT came out, um, it seems like ancient history now when ChatGPT came out. But it's literally only been a year. It's easy at this point to remember a few years before ChatGPT uh, when. AI was getting developing and and started to to come together, but hadn't reached the kind of the conversational nature that that turned everybody on to large language models. Um, only a couple of years ago, I remember you and me and our friends, you know, wondering how we would make sense make sense um, of a large corpus, how we would get you know six large corpuses together and figure out what what were the commonalities what was the common wisdom among them what was the different the differences between them the and and or a transcript right a hundred hours of transcripts uh you know uh it was wonderful that we had speech recognition and speech recognition that could turn a uh, hundred hours of, of people talking into a <laughs> into text 
but then it became an indigestible chunk of tech. Yeah. It was like something that we could say, well, in the future, there'll be system that can help us <clears throat> make sense of all this. Um, and now they're here. It's, it's an amazing and wonderful time. So it's super, really super, super, super cool. Yeah. What do, what do you, uh, maybe a final question. Um, what do you perceive as the, the greatest opportunity and threat to humanity that AI kind of presents mm -hmm. and any final <laughs> words on why it more may be more crucial than we know to ensure that we harness and align that properly towards positive and not negative uh, futures. The um, <clears throat> one of the, the common famous threats is um, a concern that, wow, ChatGPT understands language, um, uh, artificial general intelligence, uh, human human level intelligence is right around the corner. Um, so that's a, a common concern, and it's it's not something to take lightly. It's not something to to brush off, and yet it's also not something that's immediately uh, immediately coming after ChatGPT. <clears throat> they're they're nowhere. The AIs right now are nowhere near uh, human level intelligence. It's it's not hard for me to imagine that, you know, if you put. Conversely, it's not hard for me to imagine if you put a hundred x the capability of GPT together. I think you probably would get pretty pretty close to human intelligence, and so it's going to happen in the next you know five years, ten years, two years. We don't know. So back to your question: uh, opportunities and threats. Um, the I think the there's a couple weird possibilities. One of the one of the odd possibilities is that. Uh, centralized systems, uh, governments, big corporations, for whatever, say that this technology has got too much power. Uh, we we want to maintain a power imbalance, uh, and uh, AI systems are starting to democratize power too much. We don't want that, and so we're going to severely limit the capability of AI for anybody except us. Right. So we could end up in a situation where um, authoritarian kind of centralized power structures like steal uh, AI from humanity and keep it to themselves for concentration of power. Um, it, it seems funny to to say that somebody might think ChatGPT, which I just said isn't as smart as a human, not even close, uh, provides power, but they do provide a lot of power to, and it provides power in kind of an individualized, democratized way. Um, uh, ChatGPT or something like it will let me uh, learn something much more fast uh, than than you know a, a typical curriculum because I can be interactive with a curriculum and not just that curriculum but all the knowledge that the whole corpus has billions of words of knowledge about you know how to fix a bike uh, what are the best um, what are the best ways to um, make an argument and making convincing uh, statements about it. Um, how how do I make friends? All kinds of things that you can do, you can do a lot better now because you've got a capable assistant who understands a large chunk of human knowledge and is conversational about it with you, patient and conversational. So they're they're a powerful tool, um, but they they. So this is maybe kind of the the balance, the uh, opportunity threat balance that I see most. They have the opportunity to democratize power, to democratize knowledge, to help everybody be smarter, do things faster and better, um, uh, more satisfactorily to them individually. So that's the opportunity. The, the threat is that there'll be uh, imbalances that will be created by existing power structures mostly. So, you know, the on the one hand, uh, I saw a great uh, proposal by somebody uh, who said, hey, I've, I've thought about this. I've thought about how ChatGPT can level up and kind of replace you in your job. Many jobs, ChatGPT can do as well as or better than a human. So one way to kind of square that circle is he said, hey, 
um, why don't we set up a corporate structure where um, the, the rule of the game is you train an AI to do your job and, and hire yourself out of the job that it was doing. And in return, the company um, continues to pay you, you know, 80% of your salary forever. You know, it's like, you know, because they're getting the same thing, they're getting the, the same work done. You contributed a lot of, you know, uh, important capability and strength to that AI. And now it's just systematized and it's automated it, right? But if you weren't there to train it, they would have a much less capable employee, right? So since we've replaced you as an employee, um, we can free up that resources, but why don't we free it up in a way that honors your commitment and your skills and your knowledge and and you get, you know, maybe a lifetime of, of payment for the job that you could have done. And now you can do other things that uh, that better society, right? So that's one beautiful view of the future of AI. Um, you can that that same scenario is very close to uh, you know uh, the the feudal way to do that the capitalistic way to do it is um, for the corporation to say hey employee I now charge you your responsibility I'm paying you so your responsibility is to change this bot and as soon as it knows everything that you do I'm going to fire you and pay you zero um, and I'm going to reclaim all of your salary and put it towards you know my my benefit. Um, I, I'm going to increase my power. I'm going to increase my wealth. I'm going to increase my ability to have leisure time and yachts and, you know, and uh, estates and things like that. So right there is kind of the, you know, that's the, the, the benefit and the, and the, the weakness uh, that society has to face uh, as, it, as it has this new tool for productivity. Yeah. So you, so you speculated, you speculated that um, it's not hard to imagine based on where we're at that a confluence of um, current level AIs that um, synergize and make each other stronger and stronger pretty quickly ratches up to where we're within um, some unknown number of months. And likely in this decade, we have, um, when we look at the different tests of human capability, AI outperforming them on it, almost everyone. And then, and then we, we know that what that means is that we will, we will want to be training AI agents and their embodiments and robotics to be doing a lot of the things that humanity currently does. And so, um, you know, people vary in their speculations about what those percentages of, of job human, current human jobs might be threatened. Um, but I mean, generally those are in the like 40 to 80%, like, so that this is an issue that within this decade. AI is will be capable of doing the job of a member of every family in the world, right? So it's a it's a profound seismic shift. And so back to the issue of the the centralization or decentralization, not only of power, but of the benefits gained as a consequence of those, you could imagine where um it's almost kind of how how private equity works right now. It's like private equity acquires a company. The incentive is to get every person's job systematized to strengthen the company a little bit more to to get rid of the next human being so that profit increases. And it, I've watched that destroy the life's work of many of my many of my friends. And so, so that tendency of, um, let's say a a a purely self interested, soulless, capital maximizing entity to progressively put to progressively put its employees consumer slaves out of work to gain more ability to put the next employee consumer slave out of work is is going to be um on absolutely unprecedented scale so over the rest of this decade we're going to be fundamentally redefining what meaningful work is and back to these issues of commons and technologies and the products of our co-creation like deciding, okay, well, if I work with you company to put myself out of work for maybe the betterment of our services, what, what does that mean? What's justice? What's integrity? What's stewardship? What does that mean for our shared future on this planet? Right. And so what we don't want to have happen is it, it's like a potentially 
if there's a kind of this 80-20 rule that tends to happen through the universe where um, to whom to those who have are given more and those who don't have even the little will be taken away, this, this is going to accelerate that tendency quantum fold. And so the only force that can constrain that is basically human consciousness intentionally deciding what that means and how we're going to handle it. And then maybe just the last thing that I would drop in for people, for people um, thinking about the opportunities and threats of AI, in the very best sense, like Pete was saying, if I'm an individual and I have a problem and I don't know something and I'm not lucky enough to have a, a father or a grandfather or a mother or a grandmother or a mentor to teach it to me, but I need to, you know, figure out how to fix a problem in my life or my home or my environment or diagnose diseases or address, you know, mental health issues or, or pull myself out of whatever existential crisis I'm facing. AI potentially equips me with, with a infinitely patient and, um, knowledgeable mentor that can walk me through the micro steps, you know, like unbelievable examples, even like, and even creating, helping me create the tools that I need to take the micro steps. So, so the potential for humanity to pull itself out of terrible situations using these tools is, is greater than ever before. Conversely, if I was trying to figure out how I'm going to um, cause the absolute most destruction in the shortest period of time in my town, because I've decided life's not, you know, worth living and I'm going to go out with a bang over the course of 48 hours, you know, I could have AI give me the thousand best ideas to do that, distill those thousands ideas into the hundred best ones, you know, optimize those each 10 times, ratchet them up and then, and then figure out how to create, you know, the sub agents and bots to help, you know, carry out that, uh, that malevolent plan. So, so it's technology is a tool. It's, it's a tool that like our human consciousness that created that tool can be applied out of our own free will for good and for the betterment of the world or for evil and the destruction of the world. And so, you know, these decisions on whether we whether we weaponize this technology and use it to destroy our perceived enemies and in the process, the earth and ourselves, or whether we beat our swords, our potential swords into tools of life and plowshares and use them to bring about flourishing and abundant future is, um, you know, the existential question we face as a species in this decade. So, all right, well, that, that, um, probably wraps up for today. That feels like a great spot. Um, where I'd love to go with you next, Pete, is, is talking more about AI and then um, also the revolution of how we learn, um, how we transcend the industrialized educational systems of our past into creative, free, project-based learning where we're doing amazing things together as a human species aided by these tools and the ability to take these knowledge bases and deliver, you know, just in time insights and wisdom to creative agents, um, forging a better future. Sounds like a great conversation. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time, Pete. Thanks for being here. You thank are you, a Jordan. truly magnificent human and I deeply <laughs> value our relationship. So thanks for thank being you. here. As, as well, I do time. you. Thank you. Thank you.